right, AP Physics 1 students, Mr. Heinrich here. We're looking at FRQ3 from Unit 6 from the AP Classroom Progress Checks. And this is the graphic analysis question. The third one always is. So if you have questions that I'm not covering or you want to know a little bit more, make sure you ask me in the comments. I will get back to you. All right, let's jump in. So we've got our system and right away you can see this is not an everyday system. It's a device created solely to torture you as an AP Physics 1 student. So we have a group of students who would like to determine the spring constant K of a spring as shown in figure one. One end of the spring is attached to a wall and the other end of the spring is attached to a string. The string is wrapped around the horizontal cylinder of known rotational inertia I sub C. The cylinder can rotate about a fixed horizontal axle with negligible friction. Let's look at how they have this set up right now, if this is where the string attaches in, it's wrapped one times, two times, three times. And they don't really make a hard, fast statement about how many times it's been wrapped around the cylinder, but you can see everything is relaxed right now. There's three wrappings. It's attached to a relaxed spring that is unstretched. So keep that in mind as we move on to the next part. Part A, describe an experimental procedure to collect data that one, uses the setup shown in figure one, and two, would allow the students to determine K by making a linear graph. In your description, include the measurements to be made along with the corresponding equipment needed for each measurement. The students do not have access to any devices that can measure force or mass. Provide enough detail so that the experiment could be replicated, including any steps necessary to reduce experimental uncertainty. So step one would be measure the length of the unstretched spring with a meter stick. Record. Step two, twist the cylinder some amount stretching the spring and hold while your lab partner measures the length of the stretched spring. All right, step two done. Number three, and in my class, I don't really want the students talking about calculations when they're doing their procedure, but I'm gonna say this one anyway. Subtract step two's length from step one's length to determine delta x, stretch of spring from equilibrium, and record. All right, step four, release the cylinder, and as soon as the spring returns to its unstretched length, begin a stopwatch to time four revolutions at constant angular velocity. And you might need me to explain this a little further. So here's what I'm saying. If we rotate this a few times and hold it, this spring will stretch out a certain amount, right? We'll release this, and as the spring comes back to its unstretched length, this cylinder will achieve some angular velocity through that acceleration, but then it will spin at that angular velocity constantly for six revolutions. How do I know six? Well, even though they're not saying it in the instructions, this looks like three wrappings. So three wrappings would come undone at a constant angular velocity, and then the string would be on the underside of the cylinder, and it would be able to spin three more times before causing tension on that spring. I said four revolutions because I believe I could time accurately four revolutions and I could visually catch that. Hey, maybe you want to say five here. That's fine. Pushing to six revolutions, though, you're getting to that point where there might be tension on the spring, which will ruin that constant angular velocity. Let's move on to step five and be done with part A. Number five, repeat steps two through four for different, and we should say multiple. This is how we are reducing experimental uncertainty, spring stretch lengths. And don't forget what we're trying to get from a slope. We're trying to get the spring constant K. And that's the next part. Part B, from the data collected in the procedure from part A, describe how the students could create a linear graph and how that graph could be analyzed to determine K. So let's quickly brainstorm. When I twist the cylinder, what kind of energy do I have? I have spring potential energy. So I have PE elastic, or I could call it PESP. And when I release this, it starts speeding up until the spring is not stretched anymore. And at that point, I have rotational kinetic energy. So this initial spring potential energy will be equal to my kinetic rotational energy. And there's my idea for part B. From this equation, I'll figure out what I need to plot on my x-axis and what I need to plot on my y-axis in order to get a slope that is equal to the spring constant. Okay, what is PE spring equal to? Well, that would be one half K delta X squared equals one half 
I that we know, the I of the cylinder is called I sub C times omega squared. All right, and looking at this, our halves cross out instantly, and let's solve for K. K would be equal to I C omega squared all over delta X squared. I know delta X, that was from my meter stick measurements, so I'll put that right here. I C is given, I'm gonna write that just to continue to brainstorm, but omega is not directly measured. We measured the amount of time it took for four complete revolutions. So I'm gonna come over here and say, where where omega is equal to delta theta over delta t. And this is the equation for the average angular velocity because we know that cylinder is spinning at a constant rate when the spring comes back to its unstretched length. Okay, let's personalize this a little more for our procedure. We had four revolutions, which would be how many pi radians? Remember, one revolution is two pi radians. Therefore, this would be eight pi radians. And we don't need to put the unit divided by t, which we know from our stopwatch. And now I can plug this idea in for omega right here. So I'll have k equals ic times 64 pi squared all over t squared. I just squared every term because omega is being squared, divided by delta x squared. All right, and you can see I have a rise over a run. And if you said this to AP, they'd have to take it. But this is a really clunky rise. So let's take all the constant information over to the other side. That would be IC 64 and pi squared. I would have K over 64 pi squared times IC equals 1 over T squared over delta X squared. And there's my answer right there, believe it or not. This would be my slope, which is equal to a rise of one over T squared over a run of delta X squared. So let's make a little formal statement to them. We are gonna say plotting delta X squared on the horizontal axis and one over T squared on the vertical axis, K can be obtained, that is the spring constant, from a slope of k over 64 pi squared ic. The last thing to show them so that they really know you know what you're talking about is to show this calculation. So I will say slope equals k over 64 pi squared ic. Let's solve for k and k equals slope times 64 pi squared ic. And all done. Let's move on to part c. Okay, let's get ready for the long part. The students would like to verify the value of the rotational inertia IC of the cylinder. With the cylinder removed from the axle as shown in figure one, the students measure its diameter, and that would be DC equals 0 0.1000 meters, and its mass MC equals 2.00 kilograms. And this is a classic conservation of energy situation. In a series of experimental trials, the cylinder was released from rest on a ramp with various heights delta Y as shown in figure two. In each trial, the cylinder rolled without slipping down the ramp and onto a horizontal floor. The students then measured the time TL it took for the cylinder to travel a distance L equals three meters along the horizontal floor. The results of each experimental trial are shown in the table. So we vary the heights at which we release the cylinder, and then we measure the time it takes for the cylinder to travel this length L. And that's what you see right here with corresponding times for the cylinder to travel the length L. It's giving us some reminders. We know that the cylinder radius would be half of the diameter. Awesome. So for a graph that has delta Y on the horizontal axis, indicate a quantity that could be plotted on the vertical axis to yield a linear graph whose slope can be used to calculate an experimental value for IC, the rotational inertia of the cylinder. So the horizontal axis is covered. They're telling us to put delta Y on the X axis. What are we going to put on the y-axis? And remember, if the quantity we indicate that's going to go on the vertical axis is not already provided in the table, we need to use this remaining column to record values of the quantity, label the columns, and include units. So let's go over to the paper, and we're going to brainstorm a little bit. We're going to develop a conservation of mechanical energy equation, and from that, we're going to know what to put on our graph. So what energy do I have at delta y? Well, it's not moving yet, so I only have potential energy due to gravity, so PE initial. There is no other energy in the system, 
The cylinder is not moving, nor is it rotating. But when we get to this final location, after we've traveled a length L, we definitely have translational kinetic energy because there is a linear velocity. That's the same as linear kinetic energy, translational kinetic energy. So I'll put KEF plus, this thing is also rotating. So therefore I have rotational kinetic energy. So I'll put KE rot F. Now we just need to plug in the expressions that go with each one of these types of mechanical energy. This would be MGH, but our H is being called delta Y. Remember delta Y is going on the horizontal axis equals one half mass times velocity final squared plus one half I. This quantity, the rotational inertia of the cylinder is what I'm looking for from the slope of my graph in this part times omega squared. And I'll call it omega final just to be consistent. Okay, we definitely need to plug in specific information at this point. So what I'm going to do next is call my masses mc. So mc g delta y equals one half mc times vf squared plus one half ic. And remember what omega is equal to. If v is equal to r omega, then omega is equal to v over r. So I'll go ahead and put in V final squared over R squared. And I added some C's here to be a little more specific. Okay, let's go ahead and factor out from this side what we can. We have a half and a half and a VF squared and a VF squared in common. Factored out to the front, you get MCG delta Y is equal to one half VF squared times the quantity MC plus IC over RC squared. And I think they call it a capital R, so I'll transition to calling it capital RC. Okay, at this point, we have some moves to make. I'm going to realize this is my X, so I'm going to leave it over here, and I'm going to take all of this stuff and divide it to the other side, and I'm going to flip the equation. We would get one half VF squared equals MCG delta Y all over MC plus IC over RC squared. And it's starting to take shape, believe it or not. So let's do this next. I know I don't have velocity from the table they provided me, but I can realize that this final velocity is the same velocity at every point that I'm pointing at because this is a constant speed. Once this thing is done accelerating down the hill, the cylinder will continue to move forward with a linear velocity that is constant because there's no more gravity accelerating the system. Therefore, I can use my easiest equation, which is that average velocity is equal to delta x divided by delta t. So that means my average velocity is just vf equals the displacement I travel is l over the time it takes me to travel l is t sub l. So there we go. We have our expression for final velocity, which is just an average velocity. We're going to plug it in. We're going to square both top and bottom. I'm going to multiply 2 to the other side. I'm going to take delta y and separate it from the rest of this ugliness right here. Okay, so we'll get this. L squared over TL squared equals 2MCG all over MC plus I sub C over RC squared. This thing right here times delta y. All right. A couple more alterations, and I think we've got our final equation. L squared over TL squared would be equal to 2MCG over, I want to cross out this MC, and there's a way to do that. I can take the MC down here and factor it out to the front. It's a little bit creative algebraically, but here it goes. We'll take MC out to the front, and what would be left in the parentheses? You would have 1 plus IC over RC squared mc. Close those parentheses, all of that times delta y. And the reason we do this is because these two mc's now cancel out and it looks, believe it or not, a little bit cleaner. And last but not least, since the l is never changing, I'm going to make it part of my slope and I will divide l squared over to here. We get 1 over t squared equals 2g over l squared times the quantity 1 plus ic over rc squared mc times delta y. So what are we saying here? 
we're saying that on the x-axis, we're going to plot delta y as they told us to. In this big cluster of nonsense, that will be my slope. And finally, what are we going to plot on the vertical axis? We're going to plot 1 over t l squared, and that's what I need to provide in the last column of that table that they gave me. Let's head back over to the question. All right, and there is the last column filled in. Make sure you copy these numbers down. I did one divided by this squared over and over until I got all of these. The column header says one over t squared, and my unit is one over second squared. We're almost done with C1. All we have to say is that on the vertical axis, we are plotting one over t squared. And there we have it right there. We're putting one over t squared on the vertical axis. We're moving on to C2. Okay, so part two on the grid shown in figure three, plot the data points for the quantities indicated in part C1 that can be used to determine IC. For the vertical axis, write an appropriate numerical scale and label the axis, including units. And I've labeled the axis already. I put our Y values here to help us remember what we need to do. And if I look at my top value, it is 0.258. I have 25 boxes, so I'm going to take this value and divide it by 25. And after dividing this by 25, I got 0 0.01, and that means that every box is going to be a 0 0.01, and every five boxes will be a 0 0.05. So I'm going to put in 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, and then finally 0.25. And there we have it. And do you see that we have the same exact scaling on the y-axis that we have on the x-axis? That means that every one of these boxes is also a 0 0.01. Okay, it's time to plot the data. I'm going to do that real quick. All right, there is my data plot. And you can see that I had to go a little bit above it, but just by one box. So C2 is almost done, but we need to draw our line of best fit. And I'm going to start down here and go for it. Here we go. There's my line, and I'm going to average out the data, and that looks like a pretty good average. I'm going to release it, and there we go. Now in part D, I can see right here, it says, using this line that I just drew, calculate an experimental value for I sub C. Before I can do that, I need to find two perfect intersection points of my average line with the graph paper. And I found one, there it is right there, and I found the other one, and there it is right there. Those are pretty close to being perfect intersection points. I'm going to write that ordered pair right now. Okay, and there's my ordered pairs that go along with those two points that I selected. Let's go on to part D. All right, we're on the home stretch. And remember what I have from my slope. My slope M from my previous expression was 2G over L squared times the quantity 1 plus IC over RC squared MC. That's my slope. So all I need to do now is calculate my slope from this stuff, plug it in there, and then isolate I sub C. So let's do that right now. There's my general slope equation. Let's check out the plugins. There's my plugins, which reduces to 0 0.04, 1 over S squared, over 0 0.03 meters. Dividing those two, I get a slope of 1.33, 1 over meter second squared. All right, well, to isolate IC, we got some work to do. I'm going to multiply this to the top. I'll get 1 plus IC over RC squared MC equals 2G divided by L squared divided by M also. So I'm just doing a little cross multiplication right now, shifting things around. Then I would subtract 1 to the other side. I would have IC over RC squared MC equals 2g over l squared m minus 1. Ugh. Finally, I would multiply both sides by this. I would get ic equals 2g over l squared m, that's my slope again, minus 1 times rc squared mc. Okay, finally, let's plug in. And all of this yields ic equals 0 0.00. 335 kilogram meter squared. And that's it. Now, if you want to do a unit analysis, be my guest, but I promise you it's all there. Check it out. Ask me a question in the comments if you've got it. I will say this AP's key says that it's 3.35, but all of these steps are the correct steps. So I believe there is a calculation mistake on their part.
Hey, do me the favor of liking and subscribing. I'll do you the favor of continuing to roll out these FRQs. I'll talk to you on the next one. Have a great day, Mr. Heinrich. I'm out of here.